This is the Thunder, the world's most notorious fishing vessel. For 13 years, she had fished illegally as a ghost ship. She was known to everyone and yet visible to no one. When Sea Shepherd, the organization I represent, found her plundering Antarctica once again last year, she ran from us. And we chased her for the next 110 days. And at the end of that, this happened. The thunder was deliberately sunk by her, by her own captain to destroy evidence, and today lies at the bottom of the South Atlantic. She's finally rusting in peace. <laughs> the thunder fished for the world's most expensive fish, Chilean sea bass, from the world's most pristine continent, Antarctica. And with this fish being sold in potentially 105 countries across the world, it's been impossible to trace the black market trade of the Thunder's catch. And for this reason, now when I walk down a market that's selling fish, I have to ask myself, do I really know where my fish is coming from? We've seen organized crime syndicates fishing in Antarctica, so let's take a look at some of our other oceans. A few years ago, I was patrolling the waters of the Pacific Ocean with the maritime police of the island nation of Kiribati. And one day, in the middle of the deep blue, I had a chance to experience something truly spectacular. As though watching a documentary, I saw big fish like marlin hunting. I saw seabirds diving in from the sky, the occasional spout of a visiting whale, and the frenzied dance of fish as far as my eye could see. And while I was running around on my ship trying to make the most of this rare opportunity, a fishing vessel arrived. A few hours later, when this vessel was boarded for an inspection, we found juvenile fish on the deck of the vessel dead. We found a dolphin and a marlin lying on the deck of the vessel dead. And the ocean, which only recently had been completely alive, was now dead. I quickly realized that what I was experiencing wasn't rare at all. This is normal on fishing vessels. And then there are the more horror-inducing practices, which are to feed on turtles, which are caught in the nets, and even allowing trapped whales to die. With wastage and bad practices in the Pacific, I'm sure we don't want our fish to come from here. Earlier this year, I met Pierre. Pierre was a fisherman from a licensed fishing vessel and he jumped onto my ship to ask for help. When I met him, he had been hungry and he had been thirsty for 11 days. He had been abandoned by the captain of his own fishing vessel. And with that abandonment, the captain had run off with Pierre's wages of three years of hard work at the agreed sum of 20 cents an hour. Pierre also confessed to me that he was made to work every single day for 21 hours. He was beaten with steel rods and had even seen fellow fishermen fall over the, over the ship and die. I thought that buying a ticket for Pierre to go back to Madagascar, his home country, would be the easiest end to his misery, but I was wrong. With a family who was waiting to come back, for him to come back with some money, and a girl he loved who was waiting to marry him, Pierre took the only other option he had, and even today he's on another fishing vessel for another two years and is continuing to endure this cycle of exploitation. On licensed vessels such as Pierre's, 100 kilometers of hooks are set every single day. These hooks bring in sharks, they bring in turtles, they bring in birds. Shark finning which is a practice which simply keeps the fins of the sharks on board and throws the bodies back into the ocean, is commonplace. If the captain of the fishing vessel decides that four months into his voyage he's got better catch, then he simply empties his freezers and takes on the new catch. These vessels dump rubbish, plastic, oil, discarded fishing gear into the oceans all the time. 
it seems as though the subversion of law is the norm here. And I was horrified, and I asked Pierre, why the destruction? You're fishing, so why the destruction? And he simply shrugged, he said, this is the norm. With exploitation and illegality in the Indian Ocean, we don't want our fish to come from here either. Now back in 2011, when the situation in Libya was far better than what it is today, I was on a patrol of a fishing season. One day I got a call for a, re for a request with, for a medical attention for a fishing vessel. This man, his name's Lofty, the fisherman was brought on board my ship and my medic took a look at his arm. It turns out that while he was hauling in the fishing gear, his hand had slipped and a rusted blade had cut through his left arm, severing the nerves in his wrist. My medic attended, attended to him as best as she could and radioed the captain of his fishing vessel, urging him to return Lofty to port immediately because in the absence of doing so, this man would lose his arm. Unfortunately, as the sun came up next morning, that fishing vessel was still there, and this man lost his arm, fishing for an overseas consumer he would never meet. And what makes all of this even more perverse is that that very year, a single fish, one fish of the same species that Lofty was fishing for, sold at a top-end Japanese restaurant for 360,000 American dollars. And as I've later come to learn, Lofty was lucky, at least he was alive. As this video shows, there's bodies of fishermen being packed into wooden crates and then into freezers. And as this video shows, these are men clinging on to dear life in the water, being shot from licensed fishing vessels. There's so much money, and yet these men have such little justice. We surely don't want our fish to come from the Atlantic Ocean. I guess the obvious question is, why is there criminality, wastage, bad practices, illegality, exploitation, abuse, and even murder? The answer to that is today the oceans are exhausted. They're almost empty. And the demand that we impose on the oceans has to be fulfilled. And because of that, this is what has become of the industry. I guess moving ahead, the next question then is, then why is there still fish in the markets? And the answer to that is two reasons. One, the fishing industry, the distant water industrialized fishing industry is subsidized. Your taxpaying money buys these fishing vessels cheap fuel by up to $20 billion in subsidies every single year. This only means that the vessels venture further away from land, they spend months out at sea, and empty the oceans in the process. And the other reason, and perhaps more disturbingly, is the availability of cheap labor. The New Zealand Asia Institute estimates that men are trafficked onto fishing vessels under 28 different parameters. Other than being paid a pittance, these men are swindled into paying huge commission fees to agents. This leads to debt mortgage, and then this leads to mortgaging of their houses and family lands. And then after waiting for months, when they finally board a fishing vessel, they are ruthlessly introduced to the world of forced labor. Dari cumi kan itu sampai pernah saya hitung. Saya hitung itu saya tidak tidur itu tiga puluh tiga jam. Terus kalau mantuk itu ada orang dicolok itu kan mantuknya keliling, terus keliling itu dari sini ke tempat itu keliling muter. Kalau ada yang ngantuk langsung dicolok matanya itu. Bayang-bayangin rasa takut seperti itulah. Fisik itu bukan 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 sering lagi tapi makanan sehari-hari. Mukul kepala pak, sama menendang badan pak, yang pakai sepatu yang ada besinya pak. Itu saya kerja niat kerja, kenapa ada kekerasan, kenapa saya dipukul, sedangkan orang tua saya didik saya nggak pernah.
nggak pernah dipukul. Dianggap babu banget gitu. Yeah. Ini rendah banget yeah. seperti ya mungkin lebih daripada ini kita gitu, yeah. sepertinya sama orang Korea. Hmm. Itu kadang-kadang yang menjengkelkan. Saya paksa pokoknya. Seperti saya juga direndahin di situ. Masa terhina, dilecehkan juga. Soalnya saya itu enggak ada ada gunanya buat dia. These are the unheard voices of the men who fish our oceans. And in the race to fish the last of what is left, the real price of our fish is being paid by these men. There's a big disconnect in the way the fish gets from the oceans to our plate. And this is a global issue, but it's got a very local manifestation too. Any of you can walk into a supermarket and buy yourselves a can of tuna. You can also walk into a pet store and buy your kitten a packet of tuna. The listed ingredients will be the same. Seafood menus in restaurants will very rarely write anything more than fish of the day. Antibiotic tablets will list every single incomprehensible ingredient, but omega-3 tablets will say nothing. We would be horrified if endangered Royal Bengal tigers were on sale, but we shop and eat endangered fish from across the oceans all the time. Let's begin to join the dots of this disconnect. Let's not look away, and let's never forget. And let's begin by asking ourselves the question, are we, are we really that hungry? <laughs>